I work as a ranger in one of the most haunted parks in America. When I graduated high school, I had few options, no money for college and no trades or skills. But the national forest nearby was desperate for park rangers and willing to hire immediately. Little did I know what I was getting into when I accepted the job. This all occurred a few years ago, and it made me seriously reconsider my line of work. The first week I was there, I came across a cabin that was not on any map. It nearly blended in with the pines and oaks around it, being made of logs stacked on each other with no windows and only a single door. I circled around it, disturbed by what appeared to be drops of blood emanating out from the door in a fan-like pattern. But I disregarded it, assuming this must be some hunter's cabin and that the blood was likely from a deer. I opened the door and, to my horror, found the blood was not from a deer at all. There were multiple human corpses hanging from the ceiling, some cut down the middle with their guts taken out as if done by a hunter prepping a buck. The floor was covered in what appeared to be human skin, stretched out into a macabre carpet in front of the fireplace. On the table were cups made from human skulls, and the smell was so overwhelmingly rotten that I immediately turned to the side and vomited up my late lunch. As I composed myself and looked back inside, I realized with growing horror that the madman who had done all this was sitting in a chair with a shotgun in his mouth. His eyes followed me as I sprinted away, and I heard the gun go off a couple seconds later. I hid behind a tree, a hundred feet or so from the cabin, shakily raising my walkie-talkie to my trembling lips. Hello, I said, my voice shaking badly. I need immediate backup on the deer trail behind the graffitied rock on Windermere Lake. We have multiple fatalities by homicide, I repeat, multiple fatalities, and I believe we may also have a suicide. We need police in the area as soon as possible. A voice came in over the radio. Get out of there, Ranger, hissed a deep, guttural voice. Get out of there and never come back. That cabin is for the sinners, those who worship the dead stars, those who have offered their lives to the ancient ones. The walkie-talkie then stopped working and turned into pure static, but I heard the same voice approaching from behind me. I frantically reached into my pocket for my bear mace and folding knife. The bear mace seemed like such a pitiful tool as I held it in my hand and heard someone drawing closer dragging their legs through the twigs and leaves on the autumn forest floor. Now I heard the same voice, but instead of coming through my walkie-talkie, it was coming from directly in front of me. You are not one who sees the lights from the dying stars, or one who would trade your life for the knowledge of that light. So run, while you still have the chance. Behind the tree, I saw the man who had killed himself approaching. The entire top of his head was gone, though his jaw and lips were still intact. Blood poured from out of his nose and covered his eyes like red tears. It was impossible that he could still be alive, less likely walking and talking like he was. But he stood there, ten feet away in his camo jacket and khakis, looking paler than a maggot writhing in the sunlight. As I watched him, shaking with horror and unintentionally dropping my walkie-talkie, he fell to the forest floor and ceased moving, turning back into a regular, faceless corpse. My walkie-talkie started working normally again, and I immediately called the crime scene into the ranger station. They had SWAT and helicopters on the way within minutes, and I vacated the premises as fast as possible. And that was just my first week. Things got a lot weirder after that. His name was Ron Gutierrez, the head ranger Antonio Brown told me later in his office. A multiple felon, convicted sex offender, disappeared from parole a couple months ago. I think the feds put out a warrant for him, interstate evasion or something, but it didn't do any good. He was never suspected of murder, 
at least as far as the state troopers seemed to think. But clearly our old buddy Ron was up to a lot more than the police thought. There were parts of at least four bodies in that cabin you found. He shook his head in disgust, his large moustache and huge belly making him look like an agitated walrus as he did so. This is going to be a media clusterfuck. I can tell you that right now. I seriously doubt four is the final number of his victim tally. That means the FBI will be arriving too, as is usual protocol with serial killer investigations. They're going to want to see if there were more victims from other states. I just want to go home, I said. And it was true. I hadn't slept the night before, and I kept seeing the dead man's face hovering before me in the dark. And I wondered about that voice, that horrible voice. Was it a delusion or stress? It had to be. Listen, Cal, the head ranger said, putting his hand on my shoulder. I feel for you, I really do. But we're understaffed, as you know. I can give you the rest of today off, but I need you back tomorrow. Don't let stuff like this ride you. Just forget it. Go have a beer or shoot some guns or whatever you do to blow off steam. But don't let that madman ruin your life too. He already ruined enough others. Thanks, Antonio, I said, forming a feeble smile. My stomach hurt and my heart was racing and I just wanted to go home and lay down. I had no idea at the time, but things were about to get much much worse. I went home and turned off the lights and lay down in the dark. The sun was still out, but I had the thick curtains closed. My wife came home from work a couple hours later and found me staring at the ceiling. Are you okay? She asked. I nodded. If I started going crazy, I asked her, would you want to know? She smiled, amused. Yeah, sure, she said. I'm hoping I'd be the first person you'd tell. Why? Is there something you want to tell me? Nope, I said, laughing a little. She always cheered me up. I fell asleep soon after and awoke to a ringing telephone in the dark room by myself. Hello? I said, rising. Cal, this is Antonio, he said. The police are on their way. Now listen, I'm here with the FBI and they found evidence. Well... They think our buddy Ron had an accomplice. Maybe more than one. I don't know. Are you okay? Hold on, I said, dropping the phone quickly. I got to my feet, a surge of adrenaline waking me fully as his words sunk into my consciousness. Stacy, I cried, moving from room to room. I got no reply. Are you here? Please answer me, now. The house stayed as silent as a corpse. As I got downstairs, I found the front door wide open, the light from the street lamps flooding inside. But my wife was nowhere to be found. She was gone. I ran out the door as sirens and flashing lights covered the streets. Police swarmed the area with their guns drawn, telling me to put my hands up and walk forward slowly. They found no trace of the kidnappers or of my wife. Soon, Antonio showed up with two FBI agents standing to his side. They saw me, sitting there on the curb, my head hung low, my eyes wet. The agents gave away nothing behind their sunglasses, both in black suits with clean-shaven faces and short hair. The sheriff showed up and pulled them to the side. I saw him pointing at the house and talking faster and faster, his eyes a mixture of uncertainty and fear. Clouds the color of nicotine stains passed slowly overhead, and I felt my energy draining, my mind running low. I knew I might never see my wife alive again. I might never see her dead, for that matter. The woods in the area seemed endless and vast, and many people simply disappeared never to be found. Their bodies likely lay at the bottom of lakes or deep down in the dirt of national parks, far off the trails where the eyes of tourists wouldn't roam. So what do you know? I asked them 
raising my head as they approached. I dried my eyes, blinking fast, stealing myself and trying to raise my will. Well, Antonio said, we found multiple sets of fingerprints in the cabin. Only one belonged to the dead suspect and the victims were eliminated, at least those with fingers left. However, when we checked the footage of the park to try to find evidence relating to the crimes, we saw you pulling out and being followed. My heart stopped in my chest. I hadn't known or suspected anything at the time. They might even have someone watching me right now. But why hadn't they taken me? Why hadn't they just killed me, or at least tried to? Why just take my wife? I thought I might find out sooner than I expected. As the situation cooled down and my wife's trail got colder by the minute, I was taken aside by Sheriff Cowles and Antonio Brown. They looked uncomfortable. Antonio massaged his walrus mustache repeatedly, a sign of anxiety I had seen before. The sheriff looked around the street, as if hoping to find my wife just randomly stumbling out of a nearby building, drunk and confused, but certainly alive. Sheriff Cowles was a skinny and unassuming man. His body showed signs of lifelong alcoholism. Burst capillaries ran along the length of tanned face and his nose looked like a patchwork of red trails. But in his face, his dark eyes showed intelligence, and on his extremely skinny body, he proudly displayed his badge, the star looking dull and lifeless under the thick, dirty clouds that covered our town. I felt the first drops of rain hit me on the top of my head. They felt like tears, as if even the sky had started to cry to join me in my loss. Well, Sheriff Cowles said, trying to form a smile. It failed miserably, and he went back to frowning and looking around at the houses, avoiding eye contact with me. We have some good news, Mr. Lorenzo. I looked at him expectedly. He cleared his throat. First, we have solid fingerprint evidence from the scene. We are almost positive the fingerprints collected nearby are not from any victims. We tried running them through state and federal databases, but he shook his head, sighing. No leads yet. Don't give up hope, though. These things take time. The car that followed you was reported stolen sometime last night. It might be a dead end, but if we can find video footage in the area, we might be able to connect the stolen car to the murders and kidnapping of your wife. We have state and federal police on that right now. Your neighbors didn't report seeing or hearing anything. At least, not anyone we have interviewed yet. We're still going through, but as we get further from the house, it becomes less likely that anyone will have seen much more than a car, if that. Your neighbor across the street, however, has a doorbell camera installed, and we're currently reviewing that evidence. It's only a matter of time before we catch these scumbags. I'll tell you that. They've left far too much evidence behind. It doesn't look like a professional job. That means they'll probably make more mistakes along the way. And we'll find and use every single one to make sure your wife gets returned, unharmed. I still didn't look at him, but stared blankly at the road ahead of me. The rain started falling harder. Antonio went to his car, grabbing an umbrella and standing beside me, shielding him and me from the dirty rain. It's only a matter of time, I said, until they kill my wife too. You realize that? Time is not a factor on our side. As she gets further away and the trail becomes colder, the chance of finding any part of her ever again rapidly drops to zero. You're right. Antonio said, moving his huge body closer to me as lightning and thunder started. Echoing booms spread across the street. Many of the agents and police went to their cars for umbrellas or went inside the house. Any trace evidence on the street or lawn would wash away to nothing after a few minutes of this. 
most likely it already had. Why do you think we're all here? We're doing everything we can to keep the trail hot. Do you have any ideas, Cal? Any ideas at all? Don't be afraid to tell us. Nothing is too outlandish. Hell, I'd call up a psychic if I actually thought it might help us find her. I thought maybe we could try using you as bait, Sheriff Cowles said. If they followed you once, perhaps they'll do it again. I nodded. That's a good idea, I said. It's worth a shot. But I think we need to go back to the park where this all started. That's where we will find the answers. And as the police work wound its way forward through bureaucracy and uncertainty, we ultimately did go back to the park. Sheriff Cowles stayed at the site for a while, stating he couldn't leave just yet. I gave him my cell phone number and the number for the rangers station at the park and told him to call me if he figured out anything. He promised he would and shook my hand, the thin bones of his long fingers wrapping around my palm as I stared into his bleary eyes. He didn't stare back, but looked away quickly. Though this happened years ago, I still remember how he refused to look me in the face, and to this day, I wonder how much he really knew. Certainly, in hindsight, it was far more than he let on at the time. Antonio called up a few rangers, explaining the situation and asking them if they would help. They readily agreed, and he said he would pay them overtime for their help. Within half an hour, we had five rangers at the station, all armed with shotguns and rifles from the armory. We couldn't exactly close the whole park, which ranged over 200 square miles, and included campgrounds and nature reserves. But the area near the cabin had been sealed off and manned by police. Antonio explained the situation as quickly as he could. The other rangers looked at me with eyes of sadness, and some tried to avoid looking at me altogether. I kept seeing my wife in my mind, her smiling face and beautiful green eyes, looking like polished circles of emerald. We will break into two groups, Antonio said, handing me a 20-gauge shotgun and a backpack. I found water and snacks, as well as some boxes of buckshot and shotgun slugs inside. I'll go with Cal. Dean, you come with us as well. He motioned to a young ranger, extremely tall and skinny, with strange tattoos of pyramids and eyes, and half-animal gods all down his arms. He usually covered them up when at work. What are we actually expecting to find? Another ranger asked, an older woman named Ali. Bodies? Lunatics? Are we looking for more cabins? The entire thing is somewhat... fuzzy, I guess. And where are the police? Shouldn't we have police escorts as well? Look, the police did a scan of the area, Antonio said, frowning slightly at her. We shouldn't find anything dangerous. We're just looking for evidence. Anything dropped? any disturbed trails in the vicinity of the cabin that the police may have missed. Drops of blood, dead or mutilated animals. I don't really know what we will find, if anything. I doubt it will be dangerous though. Looking back on it now, a chill runs down my spine when I think about just how wrong he turned out to be. Night had started to come again too soon. We used bright LED flashlights on the trail, speaking little through the misery of the cold rain. All of us had ponchos on, but the wind began to pick up, blowing the rain sideways and into my face and clothes. I swore under my breath. What an absolutely horrible, miserable day. Dean stayed close by my side, talking sporadically. He tried to cheer me up, talking about jokes and the news and the stock market. I mostly grunted and nodded, feeling dissociated and unreal, like I was in a dream. Then his conversation took a bizarre turn. Have you ever seen, or heard I guess, heard too, anything really weird in this park? Dean asked, looking sideways at me. 
He looked much younger in his uncertainty, like a teenager trying to ask for a dance with a pretty girl, but uncertain how to go about it. I sighed, realizing he would not leave me alone. Part of me also realized he had volunteered to come out here in the middle of the night solely to help me, and that he may even end up risking his life on this mission if things went sour. But I still felt a childish spitefulness about having to interact. Yes, I've heard some weird stuff, I said. I also saw a carpet made of human skin. I guess that qualifies as weird. It does, it does, Dean nodded. But it's not, like, supernatural weird. I mean, have you ever seen a ghost or a demon or anything like that? I paused for a very long moment. Antonio walked in front of us, grunting and keeping his gun raised. The illumination from the flashlight attachment bouncing crazily off the trees and making the shadows of the branches look like arms, stretching out in the woods to grab whatever they could. I looked over at him. His face had a very serious expression on it, unusual for Dean, and he avoided eye contact. What is this about? I asked. Have you seen a ghost here? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Well, Dean said, looking away into the trees, shining his flashlight at nothing for good measure. I'm not sure. I definitely saw something strange during the night shift one time. I thought, at the time, maybe it was like, I don't know, a homeless guy on meth who was just really weird and crazy looking. But I was patrolling the trails for poachers and trespassers when someone just started screaming. I was nearly five miles away from the ranger station in the middle of nowhere, and the trail itself was rarely traveled except by hunters. My first thought was that it was a fox or some injured animal. They can sound very human when they scream, you know. I nodded. But it followed me and kept following me as I went down the trail. I turned, trying to see what the hell it was. I called out, identifying myself as a ranger and telling them they were trespassing, that the trail was closed for the night and the police were on their way. It seemed like the person, or whatever they were, just kept screaming, as if they didn't need to breathe. I've never heard anything like it. They just didn't stop. It went on for minutes, and then suddenly cut out. But ahead of me, on the trail, I saw something naked. It looked kinda like a person, but their body was skin and bones, and so pale that it almost glowed. I could see every bone, every rib, its head was down, and it just stood there with this eerie smile on their face. No hair anywhere, no eyebrows, no pubic hair, no chest hair, not even a hair on their head. Now I guess they could just shave really well every day. But your eyebrows? I mean, I don't know. People are strange, I guess. And then it raised its head, and I saw the eyes were missing, just cut out of its face. Black sockets seemed to stare at me, as if they could still see me. I don't see how. Blood trickled from the empty sockets, and its smile widened. Oh, Dean, it said to me. Your mother says the water is fine. Come on in, Dean. She's waiting for you. My mother died by drowning in Lake Winnesaki when I was ten. No one really knows about it, because I don't talk about it. She hit her head on the side of the boat and fell out. My dad had been pulling donuts in the middle of the lake, trying to make me laugh. And my mum just lost her balance or something and, well, by the time they dragged her body out, she didn't look like my mum anymore. Blue lips and swollen skin and the fishes had started to nip at her and tear her apart. Now how could this random guy in the middle of the woods, with no eyes, have known and be waiting for me? And after he said it, he ran towards me. I immediately reached for my bear mace, then realized it might not work so well on someone without eyes. Though I guess if I got it in his mouth and nose, he would still drop. 
but I turned to run, and a few seconds later, I looked back, and he was gone. Dean shuddered. That was one of the worst experiences of my life. I checked my back every couple seconds on the way to the station, and I called on the walkie-talkie for help, but I just got static and screamed back. And I swear, I was totally sober when it happened. I wasn't dreaming or anything, I hadn't even had a beer in over a week. It really happened, Cal. There's something in these woods, something strange and inhuman. I nodded, about to respond, when we heard the first skittering of footsteps from behind us. I stopped, motioning to Dean. He whispered something to Antonio. I saw Antonio's sweaty face glancing back and forth, looking down the trail with wide eyes. Then I heard it again, the snapping of a twig, the slight rustling of brush. Identify yourselves, I yelled. We are park rangers, and this is a police investigation. You are currently trespassing in a restricted area. This area is closed until the state agency clears it for reopening. If you identify yourselves and leave the area immediately, you won't be in any trouble. I waited. Nothing happened at first. Then a soft, low chuckling started from the darkness. My shotgun had a flashlight attachment, and I shone the bright LED light in the direction of the laughter. From behind the bushes, I saw the flash of an inhuman hand. The fingers looked crooked and far too long, the skin blackened and covered with weeping sores. Then it withdrew into the brush, and more laughter started from all sides of the trail. You are not at home, rangers, a mocking voice said. This is our home now. You are trespassing on holy ground. The penalty for that is death. Antonio raised his rifle, screaming at the voice. Come on and try it, fuckface, he yelled, his face flushed and his large body quivering with rage and fear. You maniacs are due for a lesson in what happens to people who fuck with rangers. The laughter grew louder, more intense, and figures started to come out of the shadows and bushes, stepping out from behind trees and appearing from the huge rock standing all over the park. All had the same blackened skin and thin, long limbs. They looked like demons who had stepped out of hell, and perhaps they were. Without hesitation, I opened fire, and they ran forwards, hissing and shrieking, their naked, sickly bodies and fire-blackened skin approaching closer with every moment. I saw the chest explode on the nearest figure, a tall, emaciated creature with bloody red eyes. The film of blood seemed about to overflow and fall down his face as tears, but it never did. The eyes of the others looked the same, and in the beams of the overly bright LED flashlights, they almost seemed to glow and shimmer. I could see the vague silhouette of pupils beneath the blood. Though this happened years ago, I still remember the way they looked. The superhuman speed of these abominations. The flakes that fell off their crisp, destroyed skin in the pale moonlight and the much brighter lights of our flashlight beams. Their emaciated, scorched bodies moved in a blur, surrounding and rushing us. The gunshots broke the stillness of the woods, and everything seemed to devolve into chaos within seconds. In the moment, I felt a wave of calmness come over me. I could see us being surrounded, see the rounds taking down the first line of blackened creatures, but I felt at peace. Everything seemed to move in slow motion. I aimed the shotgun again and again at center mass, blowing apart their chest and stomachs with shotgun slugs, and none of them rose. Blue blood spurted from their wounds. It had the hue of a dark Arctic ocean, frozen and endless. The dark blue fluid soaked into their burnt skin as they lay on the ground, gasping and dying, 
clenching and unclenching their twisted fingers with endless, gurgling screams. But we were five against many, hopelessly outnumbered. Whatever these things were, they seemed to have no fear. They kept coming, running at us, and I had to reload. With practiced ease, my fingers yanked slugs from my bulging pockets, slamming them into the shotgun. Most of the other rangers had also run out of ammo. I saw a couple dozen blackened bodies laying across the trail and the forest. Some of them dead, others dying or seizing, kicking their strangely long and crooked feet again and again, like a child throwing a tantrum. Soon they had started to reach us, and I saw them grab Antonio, heaving his massive body across the trail and throwing him to the ground. Others saw the opportunity and leapt towards him, their fangs gleaming in the artificial light. They began to bite at his face and neck. Get away from him, I screamed, slamming the last slug into the gun and running forwards. I began firing, but in my excitement, the first shot went high and blew apart a tree, sending chunks of bark and splinters in every direction. The next one hit the creature that bent over Antonio's neck, entering the back of its head and continuing down towards the forest floor. The shot missed Antonio himself by only a foot or so, but it had to be done. I had no better angle to fire from at the time. The creature fell over Antonio, but another one bent over his chest, and I saw with horror that he had bitten a chunk from Antonio's shoulder and now sucked out the spurting blood sighing in pleasure and grinning. It looked up at me for a moment, blood staining its teeth red, its liquid eyes emanating hatred and hunger towards me. I shot it in the neck, and the blue blood of its body mixed with the red of its feast, giving a technicolor hue to the life fluids that leaked out of its broken, dying body. I kicked the creatures off of Antonio. They felt surprisingly light, like lifting the body of a child. Though they were taller than any man in our group, their emaciated bodies didn't seem to have an ounce of fat, as if they had been starved for weeks and then released to feed on whatever they found. The last ranger in our group, a new and very young-looking man by the name of Roger, ran past, shooting at something in the forest, hollering and laughing. I registered it for a moment, then a scream took me back to the present. Dean shrieked at me. Behind you! I spun, finding three more of the creatures standing there, blue saliva foaming from their mouths. Their sharp teeth gnashed at the air, tasting the meat that stood in front of them before it had even entered their mouth. And they rushed at me at once. I fired three times and hit two of them in the head. The third shot went high, and then the creature was on me, knocking me to the ground. I knew I had no more shells in my shotgun by this point, having fired all six rounds. I held onto the shotgun and tried to use it as a weapon. Turning it sideways, I used it like a club, forcing it against the creature's thin, long neck. Its head came down towards my face, snapping and breathing rotten fumes into my mouth. I tasted its saliva as it dripped down onto my lips, a taste like rancid meat and chemicals. I spat, pushing with all my strength, but it continued to get closer, until its face and its many sharp fangs stood only a fraction of an inch from my own. We looked into each other's eyes, like infatuated lovers, but I knew the only thing this creature loved in me was my flesh which it would rip apart as I lay there, screaming and pleading for death. As my strength failed and the creature's face lunged forward, opening its maw wide, its head exploded, sending a waterfall of cerulean blood pouring down over my mouth and nose. I felt pieces of its skin stuck to mine, and soon I held only a lifeless corpse by the neck with my shotgun. Spitting and retching, I rolled to my side, wiping my eyes with my jacket sleeve. I looked up and saw Dean standing there, a black 30 6 Remington in his hands. He smiled at me and gave me his hand. God damn, I said, 
spitting on the ground and nearly throwing up as I tasted the blood at the back of my throat. I guess you could have waited longer, Dean. He shrugged. They're gone, he said, showing me the bodies of a few dozen blackened monstrosities laying on the ground. The rest of them fled into the woods. I doubt that's the last we will see of them, though, and I would have shot it sooner. But Ali had one on her back. Literally, it jumped on her like it wanted a piggyback ride, and it bit into her shoulder and sucked some of her blood. I took that one out and yours as quickly as I could. Then I remembered Antonio. Where's Antonio? I asked, goosebumps rising on my skin. Is he... He's still alive, Dean said, his smile fading. He pointed to Antonio on the ground. Ali stood by his side, applying pressure to the gaping wound on his shoulder. I could see pieces of his bone through it. His right ear was gone, and he had blood pouring from a scalp wound. He breathed fast, raising and lowering his arms and calling out for his wife. Ali calmed him. We're getting you help, she said. You're going to be okay. It doesn't look like any major blood vessels got severed, thank God. How the hell are we supposed to get him out of here? I asked. I tried my walkie-talkie, remembering Dean's story about how his had failed at the critical moment when he needed help. But this time, it worked. I heard the voice of a female ranger come through, and it sounded like an angel to me in that time of desperation. Antonio Brown, the head ranger, is seriously injured, I said. We need an immediate medical evac. We are on the loggerhead trail, right before it meets the Angel Trace mountain circuit. There was a long pause. I'm sorry to tell you, but there is nowhere to land any sort of helicopter in that area, she said. I think you already knew that, though. The best chance to get him out of there quickly is with an ATV with an attached trailer. But that's going to be a bumpy ride. Is he critically injured, do you think? Or... Look, I'm not a doctor, I said. But he has blood all over him. He's missing an ear and a piece of his shoulder, and he has a massive scalp laceration. Ali doesn't seem to think he has any arteries severed, but she isn't exactly a doctor either. And what about everyone else? I've already called in the paramedics. They're on their way. Another ranger is setting up the ATV attachment with blankets for Antonio, so we can pull him out of there to safety. Are there any other injuries? I looked at Ali with her bleeding shoulder. I had a few scrapes and cuts on me, but considering the circumstances, I considered those nothing at all. Dean looked totally fine, as if he had just stepped out of the ranger's station to go on a moonlit stroll. Then I looked around, lowering the walkie-talkie suddenly. Where is the new guy? I asked loudly. They all turned to me, even Antonio. We had five people, we had Roger, that young ranger in the back. Where the hell is he? Dean shrugged. Maybe he ran off when the fighting started, he asked helpfully. I mean, he didn't exactly sign up for this. I don't think most people would want to start a new job like this, to be honest. No, Ali said, frowning. He was next to me when the attack started. I saw him shooting. He had a 12-gauge Mossberg. It was so loud, every time he fired it, my ears were ringing. And then, she shook her head. By the time that thing jumped on me, he wasn't here. Maybe he got dragged away. God, I hope not. I hope he just ran back to the station. Calvin? The ranger asked on the other end of the walkie-talkie. Did we lose you? I raised it to my lips, hesitantly. I'm not sure how to say this, I said, but I think Roger may be gone. I don't even know if he is still alive. You should call the police and get some search helicopters going. I didn't add, however, that the chances of any helicopter finding him, alive or dead, were slim. If those creatures had dragged him off, 
we might find bones stripped of flesh, or maybe more likely, nothing at all. This was a total shit show, I said, once we were back at the station. A Life Star helicopter had taken Antonio and Ali to the hospital to be stitched up and given shots for rabies and infection. I didn't really know Roger, as he was always quiet and had just started a couple weeks ago, but I felt a sense of guilt for him as well. Dean came towards me, putting his hand on my shoulder. We can't give up, he said. Your wife may still be alive. I nodded, staring off through the window at the dark forest outside. I'm going back, I said, tonight. I don't have time to waste. I'll take a different trail. If my wife is alive, then the way to find her is out there. I know it. I think it's at that cabin. Aren't there police guarding the cabin? He asked. I nodded. So they say, I said bitterly. I'm going. I'll come with you, he said, looking determinedly at me. Why in the world would you want to come with me? You realize I'll probably die, right? He shrugged. I'm not so sure of that, he said. But maybe, maybe. We could all die tonight, I guess. I'm still coming though, and let's bring more guns this time. I nodded, smiling slightly. We went to the armory. I still had my 20 gauge shotgun and my backpack with slugs and shells inside. I also grabbed two pistols, a Ruger Super Red Hawk and a Smith and Wesson Model 500. Dean grabbed a judge, a pistol that fires shotgun shells and a 50 Action Express. We filled our packs with more ammo, strapping the pistols to our belts. It all felt extremely heavy to me, and I knew it would slow us down. But I didn't want to risk running out of bullets so fast this time. We also each grabbed a large bowie knife, strapping the sheaths next to the pistols. I put a few bottles of water in my pack, giving a few to Dean, and threw in some peanut butter and crackers for good measure. I wasn't expecting to be out long, after all. We set off, the night seeming darker than ever. Mostly, we walked in silence, listening to the chirping of bugs. My light illuminated an owl that flew down in the middle of the trail, looked at both of us with disdain, then flew off again. You know, owls are omens in many cultures, Dean said. Omens of what? I asked, genuinely curious. He shrugged. Depends, I guess. In Asia, sometimes they signify good fortune and luck. But the Native Americans and others often thought of them as omens of death or bad luck. Great, I said, frowning. Well, I don't believe in that crap anyways. I make my own luck, he laughed. That's a good mindset, he said. If only it were true. We got to the cabin in good time. Other than the owl, we saw nothing on the way. The forest seemed silent and sleeping, or perhaps just watching, wondering what we would do next. I saw the windowless cabin ahead, standing aloof in the silent, dark night. It looked eerie, the door standing open, as if beckoning us inside. Splatters of dark, dried blood still showed on the threshold in the front of the door, contrasting heavily with the white wood in the LED light. Isn't there supposed to be police protection? I asked, confused. I thought they had a cop out here or something. That's what they told me, Dean said, frowning. He raised his gun, walking forward slowly. This is the park ranger, Dean. Identifying myself, he yelled loudly. Do not shoot. I repeat, we work for the park. Please respond if you can hear me. The echoes faded into the trees, but I heard nothing. I walked side by side with Dean, then started sprinting forwards towards the open door. Something was wrong, and I knew it. I peered inside and saw the body of a police officer crucified against the wall. Large nails were driven through his wrists, drops of fresh blood still falling quietly to the wooden floor below. 
His eyelids were missing, cut or bitten off, giving him a look of perpetual surprise and terror. He had been disemboweled, his intestines hanging down like the leaves of a weeping willow. And from behind us, I heard laughter. Turning around, I saw Roger, the new ranger, dressed in a black robe and surrounded by dozens of the thin, emaciated creatures. He smiled, his boyish blue eyes turning cold and insane as he showed all his teeth. My friends, my friends, you have come back, he said. Thank you for that. My creatures need to feed, and your bodies will make delicious meals for them. Why are you doing this? I asked him, stepping back and slowly flicking the safety off my shotgun with my pointer finger. And where's Stacy? Roger laughed. Your wife is somewhere safe, I can assure you, he said, his face a mask of insanity and evil. She is being transformed. She is becoming something more than human, greater than humanity ever imagined. With my help, she will live forever. Would you like to join her? I'd rather die, I said, raising my shotgun and pointing it at his head. He smiled. If you kill me, your wife will die, I assure you, Roger said, pushing his blonde hair to the side. She will die slowly, probably starving. She is in a place no one will ever find her. Only I know where she is being held. But it is your choice. Do we not all have free will? The creatures around him stood as still as statues, each of their blood-red eyes focused directly on me. If I hadn't seen them move earlier, I might have thought they were simply grotesque Halloween decorations. They didn't even seem to breathe. And then I realized, perhaps they didn't. What are these things? I said, pointing to the blackened, emaciated bodies that surrounded him. Some sort of black magic, he shrugged. Black magic is just a word, my friend, he said. There is no such thing as white or black magic. There is only power, and those with the will to change the world. As a great man once said, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. I shook my head. I have no idea what that means, I said. Do what thou wilt, he said, his eyes blazing with intensity now. Do what you will. When God created the universe in his infinite energy and power, he willed it to be. In the space of a moment, it came out of the void. I, too, have a will. We are made in his image, after all. And my will has been honed and intensified. Until soon, I will approach the power of the angels. And one day, even of God himself. So what's your actual plan here? I asked. You want to create a race of monsters that goes around killing anyone they want at random. You want to kidnap innocent people and subject them to God knows what kind of horrors. All because of your will. Yes, exactly, he said, his voice raising in excitement, a fanatical gleam shining in his eyes. And I make myself the ruler of all starting with this infinitesimal state and moving on to the country and eventually the world. Can you imagine what we could accomplish without nationalism separating people into competing groups, without countries constantly fighting over resources? What if we had a leader with a true vision, one who could unify everyone and help to push humanity towards the next stage of its evolution, perhaps even towards colonizing the rest of the galaxy? But it all starts here, with you and me. So I'll ask you, would you join me? I looked over at Dean, who stood close to me, looking pale and terrified. His eyes flicked from Roger to me, as if he were watching a sports game rather than an insane spectacle of death and black magic. I'd rather die, I said, my heart pounding in my chest, my mouth going dry. Roger's face turned into a mask of fury as he screamed for his minions to attack. I fired the shotgun, but they swarmed in front of him. 
and the slug hit one of the burnt abominations in the chest instead. I swore, turning to run into the cabin. Dean, let's go! I screamed at the top of my lungs. I looked back and saw him standing there, shell-shocked and vacant-looking. Dean, I said again, and his head snapped towards me. He began sprinting as the creatures closed in around him. I had already reached the cabin door and waited for him, breathing fast. I raised the shotgun and shot one of the creatures only a few feet behind Dean. The slug broke through its leg, sending splinters of bone and blue blood spurting into the earth below. Roger screamed in rage behind us, an incomprehensible roar of fury and madness. As if on cue, the creatures started screaming too. A shrill, maddening sound, like someone being burned alive. They didn't seem to need to breathe, and the screaming went on for an inhuman length of time. I pulled Dean into the cabin quickly, slamming the door shut. A blood-stained padlock hung from a nail on the left side of the door. Looking quickly down, I saw a metal ring connecting the door to the wall. I pushed all my body weight against the door and took the open padlock in my hands, feeling the cold metal and the sticky, congealed blood. A sense of revulsion and horror overtook me, but I brushed it aside. With fumbling fingers, I slipped the padlock's shackle through the door's ring, but at that moment, a creature smashed into the other side, sending me sprawling on the ground. My shotgun went flying, sliding across the rough planks of the blood-stained floor and stopping beneath the crucified body of the cop. His intestines swayed back and forth from the force of the gun. The door flew open, and I saw the leering faces and the red, bloody eyes of the abominations as they stared in, dripping long strands of saliva onto the dirt below. Kill them all, Roger shrieked in an insane voice, and the creatures rushed in. Dean began shooting, and I pulled out both my pistols pressing the thumb levers on the holsters and releasing them. I started shooting madly, and their screams turned from fury to pain as they fell on the floor, their blue blood mixing with the red, coagulated stains below them. Within seconds, we had blocked the door with bodies. The cabin was small, barely even a room, though the wood was strong and fairly new, totally free from rot or holes. The only way in and out was through the door. With the narrow doorway blocked by a dozen blackened corpses, the rest of the creatures behind them tried to push through but made no progress. One tried climbing over the pile of corpses, and I shot it in the head as soon as it peeked through. The rest didn't follow his example. I heard their high-pitched whines and screams outside, and Roger's much deeper one bellowing orders. Get some dry leaves, twigs and logs, he said. If they won't come out, we'll burn them out. No witnesses, no loose ends. He said this last part as if to himself, his voice slowing down and becoming reflective, almost meditative in its quality. I turned to Dean, terrified and exasperated. His face reflected the emotions I felt. I regretted ever coming out here. We would most likely die, and my wife would be left in the hands of that psychopath outside, unless the police made some sort of unlikely break in the case and found her. Well, Dean, I said slowly and sadly, I think this is the end. Unless you have any plans, I sure don't. I guess we could start moving the corpses and try to fight our way out. That's probably what we'll have to do. Dean shrugged, his movements apathetic. He looked as if he also had given up hope. And then, a miracle occurred. I heard a voice I had not heard in what seemed like eternity. It was the voice I had heard through my walkie-talkies, the one talking about dead stars. What had he said to me? As if in a flash, my subconscious repeated the strange words I had heard. I remembered as if I were there, 
as if I had gone back in time and stood in the woods, calling for help with a mutilated corpse walking up behind me. Get out of there and never come back. That cabin is for the sinners, those who worship the dead stars, those who have offered their lives to the Ancient Ones. The Ancient Ones, yes, that is what he, or it, had said. That stuck with me for some reason. I thought of Roger and his bizarre ideas on will. It reminded me of Nietzsche or Hitler. Hadn't they made a movie about him called The Triumph of the Will? Roger clearly had an obsession with the power of the will. In fact, I thought perhaps his obsession had come from black magic and Alistair Crowley, but I couldn't be sure. These thoughts all flashed through my head in a fraction of a second, and I thought, for a moment, I understood something ineffable, some way out of this madness. But then it was gone, and I was just a scared man, sitting in a blood-soaked cabin, listening to an otherworldly voice. You and your cult have trespassed on holy ground, the voice said, booming and godlike. It seemed to come from everywhere at once, from all around me and even inside the cabin itself. It shook the ground and sent the crucified body of the police officer swaying again, his disemboweled intestines slowly moving from side to side. You have committed horrors and disrupted the peace of the dead. You and your creatures are doomed. You have no power over me, Roger said, his voice seeming faint and almost childlike in comparison to the voice of the other. Come out here and try it. Don't hide. Let's see your true form. The voice laughed. Dean began moving some of the corpses, trying to look out the door. I got up and went to his side. I saw the creatures surrounding the cabin had gone. They stood in a circle around Roger. His white face was the only color, a contrast to the blackened bodies of his minions and the jet black robes that he wore. He looked like a dead star in infinite space, his skin lifeless and pale. The ancient ones use you as a puppet, the voice said. I peered around and saw Dean doing the same but I could find no source for it. I too have an army, but mine are not drawn from the dead or the despicable art of necromancy. I use the forest and its many secrets. And who do you think is the stronger, the dead, or those with a connection to the living and breathing holy ground of this place? Roger's eyes widened as hundreds of animals came out of the woods a stampede of fur and feathers. I saw bears rushing in the front on all fours, approaching the emaciated, blackened victims of Roger and standing on their back legs, roaring and clawing. They swiped at their chests and faces, leaving deep gouges before lunging for their throats and with a quick side-to-side -side motion, ripping the heads clean off. Roger turned and began to run, his remaining minions following suit. The animals chased after them, and within a minute, everything had started to go silent again. We kept pulling bodies out of the doorway, and by the time we got outside, no one was left, except for some of the corpses of the monsters. We made it back to the cabin in record time, moving quickly with guns drawn. I saw police cars and FBI agents everywhere, and they started moving into the woods with searchlights and dogs. Antonio Brown was back, bandaged up and looking haggard and pale, but otherwise, okay. He came up to me and Dean. We know it was Roger. We're looking for him now, he said. The FBI and state police just searched all known properties associated with him. We found the blood of your wife, Cal. I'm sorry. We didn't find a body, but it's a lot of blood too much for someone to lose and survive. His words stunned me into silence. I had held on to the glimmer of hope that Stacy was alive, that we would just need to capture Roger, and then we could find out where she was held prisoner. I started shaking and almost collapsed, 
but Dean caught me. He pulled me over to a bench and sat me down. Take a minute, he said. Just breathe. I sat there for what seemed like hours, watching the police and FBI agents pass by, going into and out of the woods. After a few hours, a team came back. Antonio was outside, talking to the police chief of the town. The team went up to him. We found the body of Roger Gray, the police officer in charge said. It looks like an animal attack. There were all sorts of blackened corpses around him. We don't really know what they are. It looks like he dug them out of a graveyard and burned them for some reason. The whole scene is, well, it's bizarre. We don't know what to make of it. There were no animals around when we went, but the tracks looked like hundreds of bears, deer, owls, crows, and others passed right through there and attacked him. He shook his head. I swear this job gets weirder and weirder every day. I went home that night. Everywhere I looked, I saw traces of Stacy in the bedsheets she had chosen, the pictures she hung on the wall, even the dishes she had washed a couple days ago, which seemed like years ago now. Little did I know, but I would see her again. My insomnia got worse after that night with Roger and the strange voice in the woods. I had always had trouble sleeping, but now, I didn't sleep at all. I would sit up night after night, drinking scotch and watching the 24-hour news channel, or just there and stare out the window. And then, after a week, I saw something strange. It was Stacy, my wife. I would have recognized her anywhere, but at the same time, it wasn't her. She had the same eyes, yes, the same hair, even the same clothes as the last time I had seen her. But now, she was covered in blood and dragged one leg behind her, weeping and gnashing her teeth. I saw her lunge down and grab a raccoon from next to the garbage, biting its neck as it squealed and thrashed in her arms. After a few seconds, its thrashing died down and then stopped. She sucked the blood into her open mouth, her eyes shutting in pleasure. Then she dropped it, turned to me and smiled. I couldn't believe my eyes. I ran outside, but by the time I got there, she was gone. Only a dead raccoon, with its neck broken, remained at my feet. I took a leave of absence from work and began to search the woods. It was the only place I could think of. The forest where all this strangeness had begun. My intuition guided me and my heart told me that if I was going to find Stacy, or what was left of her, it would be in that forest. I would return home every night, disconsolate and broken-hearted. After a month of this, I returned home and turned on the news, pouring myself a shot of whiskey and sitting back in my recliner. The corpses were found in a campsite next to Windermere Lake within the Temple National Park the broadcaster said, and I sat straight up in my chair. That was where I worked. I knew exactly where Windermere Lake was. Hadn't I hiked it every day? The lake itself was only three miles from the cabin where this had all started, that cabin of horrors and blood. They apparently had their throats mutilated and the blood drained from their bodies. The broadcaster continued. Authorities are tight-lipped on the mutilations and murders, but one officer told our reporter that eight people are now dead or missing. The governor has responded, saying that they will close down the park if... I turned the TV off, getting up and going into my bedroom. I got dressed and put on my hiking shoes. After all, I now knew the reanimated corpse of my dead wife roamed the forest, attacking and killing innocent people. Roger was dead, but there was more work to do. I saw my wife's smiling face in my mind, and I remembered the way she smelled, like perfume and flowers. I quickly blinked back tears and grabbed my shotgun, strapping a pistol to my waist. No matter how long it took, I would bring her down 
and hopefully free the forest of this evil. It's been three years now, and still I haven't had success. To this day, I still go out at night, roaming the trails. I've found bodies skinned alive with limbs twisted around tree branches, and campers with their faces eaten off, leaving just a mask of gore and bone behind. I'll never know if they're all from Stacy, or if something else lives there. But I have a mission, and I'm determined to fulfill it. I know my wife's soul has moved on, and that something else has taken over Stacy's body. Whatever shell remains is just an extension of Roger's satanic magic, his necromancy and evil. And I won't stop hunting until I know she is at peace.